Hello, this is Harker Devine, and today we are going to uh, continue with SCP-6500 onto the path of the mage. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Now let's get right into this. Huddling around the fires. When the first winter came, when and the first fire was built, men and women gathered around it to stay warm, something that is now and forever an instinct to humankind. As the world of the anomalous enters winter, it's only natural that we gather around the closest thing we have to fires. Nexuses. Philip Verhoeven, the refugee, the role of the Nexus after the end of anomalies. Nexus 18, April 26, Sloth's Pit, Wisconsin. Huh, another one that starts here. Catherine Sinclair gave us gave a one-eyed glare to a lock of gray that had appeared in the burning vein atop her head. She brushed it in front of her glass eye, and from the glass eye she had had in her left socket, styling it like this made her feel younger. The annual jam contest, the Jam Jam, was in full swing on Main Street. It was lower energy than most years, and everyone knew why. The town was losing its structure. Gone were the everyday tropes that coursed through a story rich town, the conveniently vibrant and dazed, atmospheric rainstorms, appropriate cracks of thunder with a sinister phrase was uttered. Nexuses around the world had been in wellsprings of atomic er energy for a millennia. Now that it was dying, Sinclair refused to call it anything other than magic. Fuck Foundation terminology. If the anomalies was on life support, they were as well. Sloth's pit and magic as a whole was breeding its last. She saw it in the, in the population of the town. Hundreds of people had vacated, doing more damage in the Great Recession. She had seen it in the trees, which were slow to bloom and always had damp leaves in the fall. Food tasted worse. Things went exactly as one expected with no sub aversion whatsoever. The world had grown cold. <sighs> Sinclair knew it was worse outside of Nexus's, but she couldn't comprehend how. She was startled all the way from her thoughts by a large man with dark skin and graying dreadlocks tapping her on the shoulder. Montgomery Reynolds, her husband, handed her hot dog, a concerned smile on his face. You look dour, Catherine. What's on your mind? Reminiscing, Sinclair put down on the hot dog and stalked away from the shop. Remember when we used to do Pathfinder? You insist on playing a Kitsune Sorcerer. Reynolds rolled his eyes with a smirk, and taking wild magic, but you were effective. Remember the one time I had to interrogate a prisoner? Pike wanted to pull out his toenails to get him to talk, but I just walked up and said, Ed, hey, I work for your boss and he's telling me to spring you. I just need to know what happened. Reynolds laughed. <laughs> Those exact words, if I remember. Yes, but I said that with a Brooklyn accent. Sinclair rolled her shoulders. God, the look on Mang's face when I pulled it off. You and I did Pathfinder for a decade and you never played a wizard. Why? Wizards have to size do magic. Could never get past that hurdle. As an attempt to demonstrate, Sinclair put up her hand to attempt to weave a spell. It fizzled on her fingertips. <sighs> she sighed. Low eve to a day. Damn it. Reynolds shoot his lip. Catherine had spent her whole life studying magic. He still remembered the feeling of her tears on his skin. It's not fucking fair, she shook her head. I joined the, the Foundation, betrayed the Hand, 
Thought I could do more good here than there. She gritted her teeth. I was a fool. I wish... She paused, considering her husband. I don't know, Monty. I don't. She grabbed um, the ha out of the hot dog into her mouth and bitterly bit down. <sighs> they walked down Main Street. Years ago, it would be packed with hundreds of people, sampling jams, synthesized from the spider silk and cursed mustard. Now, maybe 50 people congregate. Negated. Loosely, debating on which mundane homemade ketchup to take home. The world felt hollow, and Sinclair was another pocket of hollowness within it. I know you want to leave. Reynolds nearly choked on his hot dog. What? Let's face it, Monty. Catherine ran out of their face. Who am I without magic? What am I? I used to be able to conjure, sell, or fire, and hurl it wherever I wanted. And now I'm lucky if I can throw a paper airplane six feet. She put her hands over her eyes. Magic is all I am, Monty. Without it, you... You, you won't. Reynolds didn't say anything. Pick her up and hug. Catherine, please. You know that's not true. Sinclair didn't say anything until Reynolds let her, her down. She threw away her hot dog and walked towards the woods. I, I'm going, I'm going to go for a walk. Are you back at the site? Very well. Reynolds swallowed. Knowing her for over a decade, he had never seen her this distraught. Not after losing an eye, not after lo losing the use of her hands for almost a year. Magic wasn't all she was. He didn't know how to make her see that. Sinclair knew magic was truly dead before she was half a mile into the woods. As sense of Slot's pit, geographical, metaphysical, and thematic was a titular pit, a bottomless aperture that had swallowed up the home of Jackson Sloth, the founder of the town. For 100 years ago, it was a metaphysical singularity. One of her colleagues had called it a plot hole that pulled stories in with its sheer mass. Unless you know the trick, you could only find it once. She stood at the edge of the pit. There was a decrepit set of wooden boards at the sign. A sign some feckless agent has put up as a crude joke. Bottomless pit and topless girls or something. It didn't matter. All that matters was that she was here. She had found it and she could see the bottom. It was a very shallow hole, maybe 30 feet deep. At the bottom of it was a massive mound of, of rotten wood and porous stone, what remained of Jackson Slot's manor. A 30-foot sinkhole was all it had taken in the story to start, and now it was ending. And so she sat on the side of the pit and looked up at the sky. When did it get dark? Sinclair looked at her watch and frowned. It only been around at three when she left. F. Monty, and it, was, it wasn't supposed to get dark until... 9.31? The hell? She tapped her watch and frowned. Maybe there was a little bit of oddness left in this town. Okay, you've taken me on a six-hour time slip. She stood up from the pit, addressing the land itself. Why? This is contrived. Even for you, is this some last-ditch effort? A cry for help? She was met with silence. I can't save you. We could have, but... She rubbed her eyes. It's too late. I'm sorry. She looked down at the pit. I'm so sorry. A crimson light shone on in the sky above. Brighter than the sun, Sinclair squinted with it and realized with amazement that she could see it with both her excellent eyes and the prosthetic one. It seemed to be a meteorite, but no meteorite could have on such a leisurely trajectory. It was daring her to catch it as it continued down towards the center of the pit. Shit! Sinclair reached out her hand feebly. 
feeling her shoulder puff, and her body wasn't what it once was. So she reached out to it with her will instead. With the right hand extended, she bent down on her left hand, a motion she practiced so frequently that she had developed scar tissue. Blood poured into her mouth, and she used that sacrifice power, but may very well have been her final story. Her final spell. Power flowed through her outstretched hand into the air as she cried, Gavanis! The air thumped from the random meteorite as it was drawn closer to her. Realizing that it would land in her, her hand, she cut the spell off when it was five feet away from her and stomped out at Amherst where it struck the grass. It appeared to be a piece of crystal or glass, about one-seventh of a circle. It looked like it had been hewn at the center, somewhat unevenly, and shone from the heat with the heat of a summer day and the light of a billion uncast spells. Oh, hello, Sinclair knelt by it. You are very interesting. She pulled a sample back from her pot. Okay, along with a set of tweezers, light shone from the crystal and knocked the implements away. Next, she reached out with the back of her hand, testing the heat. It was cool to the touch. She touched it and the world exploded into a small hell of ink and dusty bookshelves, accompanied by the sound of wind howling through autumn leaves. And an odd tingling that one only knew but when they were in Slot's pit. Her eyes fluttered shut as she saw the world sevenfold and felt her lungs fill with earth fire. <sighs> April 27th. Dr. Sinclair! Catherine! Catherine Sinclair! Sinclair! She woke to the feeling of dew on her face, the morning sun rising in the east, and the sound of her name from dozens of voices. She recognized some of them, the task force. Had she fallen asleep af here after the crystal? She looked in her hand. It was still there, its glow dimmer. She looked behind her, at the pit, instead of the urine at the bottom. She saw a darkness that went on forever. Deeper than any natural hole. She gasped in, in disbelief and slumped back, hands going over her mouth. She had to remember to hold on to the crystal. Dr. Sinclair! The call came from Colonel or Robert or Toffelmeyer, who ran over to her. Ma'am, you've been missing all night. Hold on! He talked into his radio. All S10, all S10. Sinclair has been located next to the Sergeant Pitt, his eyes widening. Christ on a cracker, Jack! The flit, the pit's back! The flit. Damn. Can't say words right, apparently. Sinclair looked at the crystal in her hand. In her other, she conjured a ball of cool, old red flame. Her heart jumped in her throat as magic flow flowed through her. Give me back to my I lab. I need to know what the fuck this thing is. Oriacalcos, or as it is more commonly known, oriacalcum is an ill-understood substance originating from Atlantis. Some have conflated with everything from the telecale alloy to beryllium bronze to plain brass, but oriacalcos was not an alloy. It was a crystal with a mass hardness of nine, but easily broken like diamonds. Crystal-based storage mediums have appeared in science in fiction over the course of the 20th and 21st centuries. This is exactly what Oricalco originally was, a storage medium for both data and energy. Recorded samples of Oricalcos are capable of storing approximately 950 mAh of power and over 20 petabytes of data. The object that fell out of the sky above Flotsam's pit is where Scotson was a fragment of an Oricalcos codex. And so Instead of storing electrical energy or meaningful data, it stores something else. Magic. When I held it in my hands that night, I knew what I had to do. I had to go on a quest. Case and Claire. The Oricos Codex. Magic anew. Before the day was e over, Dr. Sinclair had packed her bag. It was as she was heading out the door, or that she encountered her husband. 
Going somewhere? I am going on a quest, Sinclair grinned, before I face a spell. Okay, that's not in my head, but... She held up the crystals she had found. There are more of these. I'm going to find them. Where would you start? Reynolds made his way into the apartment, taking off his coat and making his way to the bedroom. Sinclair followed him. You don't know where they could be. Search for three. Dr. Blank owes me a favor, and they have an uplink to the orbital anomaly tracking system. She entered the bedroom once more, grabbing her bug out bag. I almost forgot this. Reynolds grabbed, grabbed his own before stuffing items haphazardly into a suitcase. He grinned. You didn't think I was going to let you go alone, did you? Sinclair looked at her husband and let out a warm sigh. <sighs> I hoped you'd get back before I left. Finally, he was from Doolit at the International in about four hours. She took the crystal from her pocket and drew energy from it. Buttering softly beneath her breath, a chain of gold formed around it, making an improv to amulet. Hopefully it doesn't set off the x-rays in the airport. Reynolds hefted his bat, Hagen's suitcase. The two of them ran it out to the car, leaving two months of rent payment on the kitchen counter. Excerpts from the personal journal of Philip E. Deering, JM Technician, Site 43, Canada. <sighs> Twenty-eighth April. They're telling me I'm not anomalous anymore. Like I was ever anomalous to begin with. Doug was the only interesting thing about me. For nearly 19 years, and now he's gone. He was a gray-skinned, mirror-dwelling, gaslighting, belligerent, and creepy bastard, but at least I was never alone. That's how I feel now. All the time, without a constant companion. I don't know why I'm writing this. I already know all of that, and nobody else is going to read this. Doug was a bastard, but at least I wasn't ever alone. Amelia is still here, but so I'm not, so I'm still not alone. But Doug unequivocally made me feel like shit. Without him, I feel like half a person. Like I can't stand on my own two legs some days. The leg looks different, knowing that the most dangerous things under the surface are some sturgeon. No more panthers. No more Tiamat. No more madmen running a waste treatment facility beneath our feet. It's like there's no more color there. No, that's not true. I found a bit of color on my walk today. Looks like some sea glass. Bright yellow. Maybe from a beer bottle? It's rough to the touch. Much though. My charge to Dr. Okori. 9pm-ish. Doctor has gone on away on on business with Ivanez. Apparently, I left for a slot's pit the same day that a pair of schmucks from Site 87 arrived. Weddle gave them death glares at every opportunity, and there's talk of them liquidating aiding the site. Doctor Blank just says that they're here to use his orbital anomaly thingy. Watch a move with Amy. I met Ellie. Good stuff. End of April. Fucking crazy dream. I think that glassing is anomalous. I was in a workshop. It looked like a foundation site. I was reminded of 19 for some reason. Probably because it's on everyone's mind after the GLC nuked it. Some brought a hammer on my head and shattered me. I exploded into sevens. I saw myself from all of them. A temperate Rainforest, a rainy island, a mountainous port town, a bayou, a street in Portland, a bottomless pit, and Lake Huron. I know where each of me was, and that we must all never be joined together. I don't normally write like this. It is this stupid thing making me smarter? A better writer? What the hell? I'm going to find someone. Dr. Reinders is still here. I don't care if it's 3 o'clock in the goddamn morning. This is huge.
Site 43 security camera footage from the 29th of April. At 3.12 of, of 23, Philip E. Deering exits his personal quarters. He is carrying an unidentified yellow object in his left hand. At 3.17.05, Deering enters habitation and sustenance and uses the terminal to find the personal quarters of, uh, I think that's, Ice Rainer, Reindeers. At 3.25.19, Deering knocks on Dr. Reindeer's door. She emerges, rubbing her eyes with a disgruntled look on her face. Daring sure shows Rainer the object in his hand. Her eyes widen. At 3.29.27, Rainer and Daring are seen walking together. Rainer is drinking coffee from a can. They turn a corner er, and come um, upon Dr. Catherine Sinclair and Montgomery Reynolds. Heading from the OAATS monitoring chamber towards the er, temporary on-site on quarters. At 3.30.32, at 3.30.32, conversation and ensues. Continues for approximately three minutes. Dr. Sinclair cap bears an amulet she is wearing to the object that Deering has been holding. The sight begins to shake. I don't even know how to process what I just saw. When the sight began, to, when the sight started to shake, we thought it was an attack by the GOC at first. They've been going crazy trying to grab onto straws us for any form of control. A few years ago, there was this woman, Brenda Corbin. She ran off with 5866, which was the literal, actual Tiamat, the one from mythology. And we thought she was dead. We thought she had died alongside Tiamat when the whole, whole, whole collapse started. But she was standing there, larger than life, on the shores outside the site, riding Tiamat on shoulders. Tiamat looked like hell. All skin and bones and wings that looked like they had been torn to shreds. Covered in oil, she spoke through Corbin. You have a piece of the Codex. Give it to me so that I may return magic to the world and I will spare this place. Timon looked like she was going to eat me if I didn't. Then the dreadlocks guy, Red Enolds, stepped forward and looks at the two of them, holding up the glass thing I had. To this point, I didn't think he looked all too eloquent, but he addressed them like they were royalty. They were royalty. Great goddess, you know what we hold. This is a means to undo the crisis, to revive magic, not just for you, but the whole world. We will not relinquish it, but we shall bargain. What have you to give, Majorling? Tiamat asked. I've seen Dr. Okori do magic before. It was nothing like this. Reynolds held the crystal in his hand and held it out towards Tiamat. Screwed his face and yelled at what I think was supposed to be a... A pun. Carpe Deus! As opposed to Carpe Diem. It was like honey-covered sunlight shone through it, enveloping her in a coat of golden threads. They wove her back together, cleaned the oil off, restored her skin and wings. He held it up to his ear, then put it in his pocket. That was a fraction of what, of what can be done with this, great goddess. You are restored. May we take our leave? Carbon spoke for Tiamat again, saying that she would need to make consul with each other. Who the fuck talks like that? But that the site would be spared for that day. We've been in an emergency sh shelter since then. I have to go not happen. Woke up to all. S oh, ooh, of all things, applause and cheering. I don't know why. Then I saw a. Literate gaslighting gray skin bastard in my mirror. <sighs> Things are getting a little bit out of hand. Apparently, I've been tilted right for a little while. A little bit crazy, if you ask me. Act tech. FTS seen Primus, the island of High Brazil atop Mount Mailer. Enter the gentleman Lord Blackwood and the Mage Sinclair. Lady Maid, forget the, if the tongue we speak here, the land itself has twisted our speech thus. A celebration we think of magic, damnable and overly proper me things. Hey, an annoyance that springs upon my tongue. I have been transported back to school times. Many a day, a wasted reading the bard. Reading the bard, a waste, you jest.
Sorry, good lord, I dropped up to 9%, but truth told, EM says foul to mage tongues. Ah, the land brings wit to you, fair mage. Not that thou lacked it before, tis now greater. Pray, lord, for levity escapes me now. I feared magic lasts forever, for ill. For ill? I dare not say for good. How is death good? How is an error's end a festive time? Tell, hast thou learned of the attacks upon sites? Aye, but not by whom? Tis a collation. Mad they are now. Now, were they not before? Burke burning in, in gads. At e, a part of my French, said Clay the mage. Tis not French, for now in Eams we speak. Touche, but hey, they count down to adolescence. They seek control over the atomic world, as if they could tame magic. Lord alive, you'd some retainment to rask than domics. Hey, upon our shores, they have been seen. Good lord, tis luck that I feel some power return. This codex crystal, it gives your rights breath. And my lungs as well, gone are teary nights. Viger feels me once more. Worry also, for if the codex runs dry, what then? I shudder to think of magic's final end. I know your fear, fair mage, but hark, I bring a warning. Of what? Of whom? A man I once knew, the cleverest crow. Exit all. Act 30 is C in, in Secundus. Former Project Key Facility 23. Enter the Alchemist Reynolds and the Obeyeth High King. What manner of mockery is be this? Tis a result of the Codex you seek. Pray, how doth thou know of the Codex? Pa, my king, I am a simple consultant. Mystic arts escape me much the time. Aside, Pentameter is bad enough to chant. Thank God I am not compelled to rhyme. Anyway, it brings life back to Brazil. There might be more magic here since time's done. Lightning struck, we all are. Energized. My Catherine feels the same. Alas, she still hesitates to do right. Why for? Her power is atrophied. She lacks will. Or she feels she does. Now the Codex? I saw it falling onto our shores. And upon Mount Baylor, it fell. Alas, it left naught but a crater. Is it destroyed? Stolen, I expect. Coalition adds. All the world owns a forest, and they are lumberjacks. Lumberjacks, my king. Why? Rainforest. High Brazil, the pit, the street... All these are bastions of magic and life itself, like the Amazon, but more endangered. We've tracked the fragment here. Enter Col Eastern Agent Bo carrying a codex fragment. Perish, O oh freakish elf! O oh hellish mage! Back! Zounds, he possesses a fragment. Stay back! Zounds, really? Fucking hell, this nexus sucks. Thou hast nary a single way to stop me. I shall claim this fragment for the sake of control. Gods, what's wrong with his speech? It's off meter. Ha, huh, please, you think they break eat the books they burn? Tis a wonder they he could find his way here. Refraction the codex and attempt to control it. Instead, split it and scatter it to the four corners. You shall not claim it. The coalition will be born again. Reforage like a phoenix, the soul mages in the world. Foul villain. Someone device, the obey it produces a, a pistol and shoots Agent Bow. He falls. Don't monologue. A gun? Thou uses a gun? Freakish fairy. I adapt what magic uh, decays anon. 
Agent Bao closes the codex fragment. He exits the stage left. Now you've done it, King. After the full fiend, after the foul fiend. Nay, we have several lines still. Now let me. Ita... Now tell me, how do you feel about soliloquies? Gods, no. Fine, but it must be done. But ah, the next scene then. What are you saying? Exit all. <sighs> Act Tertius. Scene terminus. The shores of Hyper Zeal. Enter the gentleman Blackwood and the mage Sinclair. Lord Blackwood, this clever crow. Who is he? To the cleverest crow we owe our life. From the seas of chaos he plucked thirteen. Men and women, all great thinkers, all strong hearts. Great, I guess he didn't like non-binary people, but okay. He is so as zero, but I knew him as Norris Arclay, a mage stronger than thou. Thou art strong, fair Sinclair, a solar storm. Fair Norris was a supernova. Hey, heard you of Trinity, the city that survived the nuclear strike intact. Oh, our clay ages was upon it. Ah, uh, then there's Victoria's venomous ovale, where denizens eat and live in poison, and spiders live in the snouts of dogs. Our clay did cure and curse it. It was he who saw the venom spread by I, I clan Murdoch's minions. At times it's expunged, alas, the sang fangs found in all those in Dovel. And then there is. Uh... My lord, please, I cannot. Our clay is an arcane master, my lord. Yes? Why call you him a crow and cleverest? When forming this foundation, I saw men who were crows, black cloak. Oh, clad ominous and ambitious, our clay appeared and asked for membership, offering much to me. Cleverest, why I cannot remember. Beg pardon, Sinclair. Tis not mine to give, entered the agent bow, limping. What on earth? Agent bow draws a pistol and aims it at the codex fragment. Back! Back, I say! My vote is half a kilometer down on a beach. I don't get there safely. Or right, the fragment gets it. Ah, wonders ever cease, coalition. Sinclair draws her two codex fragments. The third, orange fragment held by the agent, is drawn to it. For all our flaws in that we tried to preserve, that would have made this world extinct aeons past. The agent and bow fires and misses. Blackwood draws his rifle and fires. The agent falls. How? How the fuck did you do that? You're a fucking sea slug and you pulled a fucking gun out of nowhere. How? A sea slug and such foul words. Thy nerve shocks and neither does thou say in meter. Zounds. Sounds again. Sinclair takes up the codex fragment and joins it with her too. Well, it's a cure for the time being. My lord, yes, Mage Sinclair, might we stay for it or a night? Argentina is a distance away and we tire. Then we shall retire, and of the agent, I shall alert the guard, but fair Sinclair. There be things in the water still. Hungry. Fair fortune, adversary. Go fu- Exit all. Okay. Now that we know we're on chapter 4, I think that's a good stopping point. This was... Uh, the beginning of the mage's path. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel.
obviously we will continue this path tomorrow. So until then, goodbye!